Good evening. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, it's been a while since uh, I have uh, been back uh, and spoken here. It's uh, been uh, a year since, a little over a year since I returned from uh, exile in West Tennessee. No, not really. Uh, but uh, it's been a little while since I, it's been about a year since I've been back, and I'm glad to be back in the area. Glad to see everybody. Uh, there's some faces I recognize here, some faces I don't recognize, and uh, that's good. I'm glad to, to see the growth uh, taking place here. <clears throat> good to see a few folks from Rockbridge. I won't tell Rich that I'm the favored one, but it's, uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, but we're certainly glad that you're here tonight. Uh, turn with me to Exodus 14. Uh, as we wrap up this, uh, this meeting, uh, thinking about the life of Moses, I want to look at an example out of Moses' life uh, as he dealt with uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, and f before chapter 14, we see uh, the plagues happen and we see uh, Pharaoh releasing uh, the Israelites to go on their way. And Moses is leading them out. And then Pharaoh has a change of heart uh, and decides that uh, he's not real happy with letting him go. And, and you can understand that because uh, free labor, right? Uh, to this point, the Israelites had been labor for the Egyptians. And, uh, you know, now they're gone. And now they're going to have to do their own work. And, and certainly uh, you can see why he would uh, suddenly regret letting them go. And so uh, they decide to chase after. And I actually want to draw back to verse 10. So Exodus chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 10. And as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt? that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Think about this. <clears throat> Think about being an Israelite. Think about being in slavery, being let go. Think about what you just saw God accomplish. I mean, you just witnessed the plagues. You just witnessed what God had performed, the miracles that had happened. And you're being led away. And then suddenly you look back. And it's not just Pharaoh and a few of his friends. It's an entire army. It is a huge army that's come after you with chariots and soldiers. And you're outnumbered. And not only that, you don't have any weapons to fight with. You're defenseless. You could pick up maybe some stones and throw them at them. But that's not going to do a whole lot of good against the armor and the weaponry that the soldiers have. So, you know, they have a right to be scared. And you can see, and I think each one of us could look and go, yeah, yeah, I, I'd be scared in that, that instance. But they just witnessed the power of God. They just witnessed what God would do. This is going to become a re reoccurring problem for the Israelites we're about to see, in fact, right after this event that we're going to talk about tonight, God's going to part the Red Sea. He's going to lead them through. And you know what's still going to happen on the other side? They're going to complain. And they're going to forget God. And they're going to end up wandering for 40 years across a desert that doesn't take more than probably two or three weeks to cross. They're going to wander it for 40 years. Why are they wandering it for 40 years? Because they didn't trust God. They just witnessed, and they have witnessed time and time again God delivering them. And they're going to witness times in the desert where God's going to help them. And yet they're still going to say, oh, God, where are you? You've done nothing for us. You know, and they're going to complain. And it's going to lead to the folks who are leading this group right now. 
They're going to die off in the wilderness. They're not going to get to go into Canaan because of their unbelief, their unfaithfulness, their lack of trust in God. There's a warning in there for us that if our faith isn't strong enough, if we don't trust God enough, if we're not there enough in our relationship with God, guess what? We don't get to go to Canaan either. But that's not what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about the three key concepts presented in verses 13 and 14 that Moses utters. Now, Moses is a man who is also not going to see Canaan. Moses is going to disobey God. He's going to get so mad at the Israelites. He's going to, instead of doing what God asked him to do, he's going to do something else. But Moses still is considered, even to this day, a great leader. And I think we can understand why. So let's start, start at the very beginning. Let's start with the first word you see there on your screen. Stop. Moses wants the Israelites to stop fearing. Now, there are a lot of things that we fear, right, in this life. I don't know what your fears are. Maybe you fear death. Maybe you fear spiders or snakes. Maybe you fear strangers. Maybe you're like me. You fear heights. I had a, a friend of mine who was a minister who said, you know, when Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, he meant, lo, I am with you always. And I said, I like that. I agree with that. But I don't know what your fears are, but there are things we all fear. There are things that, that worry us. Sometimes they keep us up at night. Sometimes they keep us up for days or weeks or years. Maybe you worry about your children, worry about the influences of the people in their life. Maybe you worry about your retirement. Maybe you worry about your job. Maybe you worry about your health. I don't know what it is you worry about, but there are any number of things that can take our focus away from the things that God wants us to focus on and to focus on the things here and now. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about the things here and now. We should be. But as James would write in the book of James, don't say, oh, today we're going to go doing this and this and leave God out of your plans. For today, your life is but a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. Okay? We want to keep God in our plans. We want to think about this, but we don't want to become paralyzed by our fears so that they don't allow us to do what God demands of us. And fear can become paralyzing. We know that, that fear has a way of gripping us physically and causing us not to do anything, to just stop what we're doing. And we can be so fearful from a spiritual standpoint that we stop, that we don't do what we're supposed to do. And so Moses is saying, stop fearing, do not fear. Okay? Because fear is deceitful. How many of those things in your life as you look back on that you worried about never came to fruition? Those things that you consumed you, that you were so worried about, never ever happened. And you spent all that time, you wasted all that time that you could have used for profit of something else. And so Moses reminds them not to fear, but he's also trying to get them to understand, do you not recall what God just did? Do you not know that God is bigger than your enemy? There was a, a show years ago, a few, several years ago, I don't know how long it's been, called Veggie Tales. Maybe some of you have shown it to your kids. And in one of them, there's a song that God is bigger than the boogeyman. Some of you may remember that. I'm not going to sing it for you, but if you want to go home tonight and YouTube it, you go right ahead. <clears throat> but it was a song that a child was singing to help him get to sleep at night, to, to not be afraid of the dark. But God really is bigger than the boogeyman. God is bigger than anything we can face. Moses is trying to get the Israelites to understand God's bigger than Pharaoh and his army. They don't hold any power. Do you not remember what just happened? Do you not remember? And then he goes on to proclaim, and not only that, but just watch what happens. He's going to remove them from your sight forever. In fact, he's going to remove them from everybody's sight forever. He's going to rescue you once again. 
but you have to stop being fearful. And so spiritually speaking, we have to stop being fearful as well. Here are some verses for us to think about, other verses in scripture. Psalm 23 and verse four. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulations, but take courage for I have overcome the world. Isaiah 35, verse four, I love this verse. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Daniel 10, verse 12, then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, from from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to your words. Matthew 10 and verse 28, do not fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul. And of course, the word fear there is actually more of a word about awe in response to God. You see, throughout scripture, we're reminded God is bigger than the boogeyman. God's bigger. God can deliver God can do things that nobody else can. God spoke this world in existence. I don't have that power. Now I can walk into a room and go, let there be light and flip a light switch. That's about the extent of my power, okay? I don't have the power to just create by speaking. And yet the Bible says just that. God spoke the world into existence. Let there be light, let there be land. Have you ever looked around and go, man, God had such an imagination. Just look at mankind. Look at all the types of people. God had an amazing imagination. But then don't stop there. Think about the animals. You know, a giraffe with a long neck. Kind of a weird creature. Okay. Hippopotamus. That's kind of a weird creature. You know, there are some really weird creatures out there. God had a pretty good imagination. And guess what? He spoke each and every one of those into existence. He breathed life into them. This is the being that we serve. This is the being who says, I will fight on your side. Why are we fearful? What should we fear? You see, Moses is trying to get them to remember this God, sir, is working for you. He's on your side. With God, nothing is impossible, Paul would say. But let's not stop there. Let's move to the next word. Moses says, do not fear. Well, okay, what's the next step? Verse 13, he says, stand by. Now, some translations may say stand or stand firm or any number of phrases that could go there. But I want you to take note of a couple of things. First of all, that word stand there is not an inactive verb. It doesn't mean just kind of hang out, just kind of, you know. It doesn't mean sit down. It doesn't mean anything other than plant your feet, okay? Now, some of you have played sports and some of you played football, okay? And some of you, like me, were a lineman or a linebacker, okay? And before the play, you planted your feet. You got ready. You were going to drive yourself off your feet. You were going to use that. For those of you who maybe played baseball or pitchers, you used your foot off of the mound to drive yourself forward. You planted your foot in order to create something strong to drive yourself off of. This word stand is an action word. It means to dig in. It means to plant your feet. It means to grow roots, to be unmovable. Once you stop fearing, you'll plant yourself right there right there where God is. You'll plant yourself and you will be unshakable. That's what Moses was trying to get them to understand. Let God work. Plant yourself in him. Let him work. Let him be in control. Let him be in charge. And you won't have to worry. Because the truth of the matter is, you can't win on your own. 
You can't defeat Satan on your own. You're not strong enough. You're not powerful enough. You can't beat Satan. And in fact, the reality is you actually can't beat life on your own. The reason, well, one of the reasons, I think there are a multitude of reasons, but one of the reasons that God created the church, he knew we'd need help. He knew we would need our brothers and sisters to fight through this life, that we couldn't walk the road alone. And while, yes, he would be there, we would also need each other to walk this road, to walk this life, to take this journey. You cannot win on your own. You need God. And you need to let him be in control. That's part of standing firm is letting God be in control. Again, this is not anything lazy. It takes work to let God be in control. It takes work to let go and let God. It takes work to become selfless and sacrifice self for God. It's not accomplished overnight. It takes work. In fact, it's a lifelong journey to be honest with you. But there is this element of being strong to know and trust that God is there and will take care of things. Plant yourself. Let's look at a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses eight and nine, be of sober spirit, be on the alert for your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Psalm 46 and verse 10, he said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Moses says, stop fearing. Do you not remember what God has done? Guess what? He's going to do it again. So stop fearing Be faithful, plant yourself in God, let him do his work. Let him take care of the problem. Yeah, you're right. You can't beat Pharaoh's army. You're not strong enough. You don't have the weapons. You don't have the organization. You don't have the numbers. But guess what? You don't need any of that. The same is true in our response to the devil. We can't beat the devil. You can't take him on. You don't have the weaponry. You don't have the organizations. You don't have the numbers but what you do have is God. And if you will stop fearing the devil, if you will plant yourself and stand firm in God, he'll take care of him for you. There's nothing he can do to take you. Think of it like this. I liken this standing firm idea to this concept. I saw on TV several years ago when there were a lot of tornadoes going on and hurricanes There was a group selling buildings that you could build that would withstand a certain uh, size wind, you know, withstand certain uh, conditions. And they sold it as a safety place that if you built this and you went in there, your life would be saved during a tornado, during a hurricane, during whatever it may be. That's what God is. He is your safety place. If you plant yourself inside there, there is no way in the world the devil can get you from him. The book of Revelation reminds us that if our name is written in the book of life, we're protected by God. And there is nothing the devil can do to take you from him. The only way the devil has power, the only way you lose is if you let the devil take you. If you give in to your fear, if you stop standing firm, in the Lord. But notice this progression. Moses says, stop. Remember who God is. Remember what he's done. And when you do that, guess what happens? When you stop 
and you think about who God is and you think about what he's done and you think about the fact that he is this powerful being, guess what happens? You stop running and you start planting. You start drilling deep. You start digging roots within God. You start to stand firm. When you stop fearing, you start planting. But what happens then? Well, that's the third of our three words. And that is C. Moses tells the children of Israel to stand by, plant firm yourself, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Same thing is true today. You can find salvation today, by the way, and see that salvation. But I love verse 14. Verse 14 is the key to all of this. He reminds us, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent, while you stand firm, while you stop complaining and stop fearing, God's going to fight for you. And is there anybody that you would want more on your side than God? Many years ago, there was a boxer by the name of Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was at that time, the most feared boxer in the world. I mean, he was, it's like his hands were lead. When he'd hit somebody, it'd do a lot of damage. And a lot of times people, you know, hey, if I get in a fight, I'd want Mike Tyson on my side. Or maybe you're more of a martial artist guy and you think, ah, I want Chuck Norris on my side if I get in a fight, right? Because, you know, Chuck Norris, there's nobody defeating Chuck Norris, you know. But the truth of the matter is, both those guys, they're human. Mike Tyson eventually lost a fight to a guy he wasn't supposed to lose to. To a guy who there's no way in the world he should have lost that fight. He lost to him. Chuck Norris has lost many a fight. He hasn't won every fight he's in. Now, there's two great fighters, but they're flawed. They're not undefeated. But there is someone who is undefeated, who's never lost God. And he never will lose. And he says, I, I, I want to be in your corner. I want to fight for you. All you got to do is let me go. Take me off the chain. Let me fight for you. Ring the bell and I'll be out there. And you don't have to do anything. You just stand firm in your faith. You be faithful. You love me. You do what I say. I'll take care of the rest. The problem for us is our sight line. We're human. We see from a physical standpoint. We don't think and we don't see spiritually. We live most of our life if we deal in the physical realm, the physical world. We, we deal with pain and health and death and all sorts of things from a physical perspective. So we think physically. That's what our world is wrapped up in. And, and we're pressured from the world around us to think only physically to think of only pleasing the physical. But the reality is we are more than just physical beings. When God created us, when, when they looked at us and they said, let us make man in our own image, part of that imagery is an eternal aspect. We have a soul. We have something that will be eternal. We are are spiritual beings. We're not just physical. There is coming a day when the physical will pass away and the spiritual will remain. I have no idea what that's going to look like. That's beyond my pay grade. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. And I don't have to because God's taken care of that. That's his realm. That's his place. There are things that I, I don't, I think when we get to that spiritual aspect, we are going to be so overwhelmed with the things in the spiritual life, the things we don't currently see that are there because we, we only look through physical eyes. 
Heaven is going to be a place. It's described in the Bible in human terms, but I don't think it fully captures the true beauty and awesomeness of heaven because I don't think the human language can do it justice. It's God's. It's eternal. It belongs to him. There are no human words that can truly do justice to who God is. So there's no way there's any words that can do justice to the place. So he, God uses the best words that we have to describe it to us. But it's going to be better than that. I guarantee you that. And I'm pretty sure, in fact, I, I'm not just pretty sure, I am 100% confident that I'm right in that. But we look through human eyes. We've got to start looking at things in a spiritual sense. We've got to start thinking of eternal elements and not just focusing on the here and now. John 3.16 is a well-known verse. But verse 17 isn't always thought about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's that word eternal again. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. Romans 5 verses 6 and 10 is is one of my favorite passages. For while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There is an eternity element coming. We've got to stop thinking from a human perspective. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that's us, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. There is coming a day of eternity. And to be honest with you, that word means very little to us. We don't really understand that concept. To a little kid, eternity is January to December, Christmas to Christmas. As you get older, those days move much, much faster. More teenagers, somebody who's 60 is old. When you get into your 30s and 40s, you realize 60 is right around the corner. It's not that old. A hundred, ah, it's old. But the reality is a hundred's not even that old in comparison to eternity. It's a concept we really don't understand because we are defined by time. We're defined by being born. We're defined by being, by dying. And there's a span of time there. But the reality of eternity is there is no span of time. It is forever. A concept we just do not get but it is coming and there is a choice for us to make. We're either going to see salvation or we're going to see condemnation. And Moses is trying to get the Israelites. Unfortunately, they would all see death in the wilderness and not see Canaan. But Moses was trying to get them to stop fearing, to plant themselves, stand and to see because if you are not fearing Satan, if you are standing firm with God and letting him fight, you are going to see salvation, a home with him everlasting. See the progression? Now he's also predicting that God's going to save him and he's going to do so through the Red Sea. But the reality is this message is just for much for us as it is for those during Moses' time. Do not fear Stand firm and see God fight for you and give you salvation. So I ask you tonight, what are you fearing? What's holding you back from being faithful to God? What's holding you back from seeing the salvation of God? Or maybe 
Maybe you don't fear. Maybe you're a little wobbly. Maybe you got those, you know, you ever run, you ever get out in a hot day and run or do something, something out in the yard and suddenly you kind of get a little wobbly, start shaking, your legs kind of, you know, do one of those numbers and you can't stand upright, can't stand firm. And if anybody were to come over and just kind of push on you, you'd fall over, you know. Are your legs wobbly? Have you planted firmly? Are you, are you an oak or are you a stalk of wheat? What have you planted? Because if you do those two things, you're going to see the salvation of God. But if you refuse to do either one of those, you will not see the salvation. Are you seeing the salvation of God? See, the truth of the matter is you can know tonight, am I saved? Am I right with God? Because the Bible is clear. The Bible tells us that God sent his son, and not for pleasure. He sent his son because of us. God knew we were going to mess things up. He made it perfect. Man made it bad. Man messed it up. Man brought sin into the world. God knew by giving that choice, man would eventually make the choice to sin. And he knew that there would need to be something done. And so he sent his son to walk this earth perfectly without sin for you, for me, because I messed up. Paul tells us in Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But there's a second part to verse 23, or verse 23 in chapter six, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It's possible to see salvation. It's possible, but you have to admit you're a sinner. You have to realize you've separated yourself from God and there is no way back on your own. The only way back is through his son who came to earth and died, who hung on a cross, painful death, nails in his body and had to push against those nails, against that cross to even breathe. Can you imagine how taxing that was? How painful that was? But he did it for me. He did it for you because he loved you that much. He believed you were worth it. You need to admit that you need him, that you need to be saved, that you need God's forgiveness. And there's only one way to achieve that. And that is after confessing your sins to be baptized, to have that washed away, not because the water's special, it's just water but because it symbolizes your dying of sin, killing the old man, putting it in the grave and getting up and walking as a new creature, a son, a daughter of God. Where are you tonight? I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're facing, but I know this much. I know that God loves you more than anything. And I know that the folks here love you as much as God does. And they want you tonight to be saved. And so I beg you, I urge you to consider tonight your salvation. Where do you stand? Don't leave tonight until your salvation is right, till your relationship with God is right, till you no, when you walk out that door, you're going home to be with the Father. And always remember, when God is on your side, he will fight for you while you keep silent. If there's anything we can do, any way we can help you, then we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.